Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Most of you probably know that I recently made an entire video on this one verse, pretty much. So instead of going over this one again, because that's almost a whole video in itself, um, I'll just link that video in the description box in case you don't remember. In, in that video, I talked about New Testament obedience being obedience to the faith or the gospel and what fear and trembling actually is, as well as what it means to work out and not for your salvation. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll link that below. So moving on here. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Murmurings means you know, do all things without murmurings. And murmuring, murmurings is grumbling and complaining. And the word was also translated as grudging in First Peter chapter 4. When Peter instructs the church saying, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things have fervent charity or love among yourselves. For charity shall cover a multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. So that would be, you know, the same as it here, murmuring. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And that was in First Peter chapter 4, the scripture that I just read. You know, we've received a very great and precious gift, the manifold grace of God. And now we're called to be good stewards of that gift. And minister that same grace that we've received to others. And I've noticed, you know, you can't minister something that you haven't received yourself. I think that's why there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of false, you know, woods and sheep's clothing in the pulpits that are pretending to uh, be ministers or call themselves ministers. But what are they ministering, you know? You know, they might minister good behavior or doing the best you can. But, you know, the more I see the vision of what God's doing in his church in and through Christ for his glory, I can see that the reason that's all that they minister, it's because they aren't partaking of him themselves. Not, you know, some of them, some people that don't actually minister Christ and are just ministering you know, like Galatianized teachings, uh, cleaning up your flesh and all all of that, um, some of them may certainly be saved, okay? They've just been bewitched by Galatian error and drawn away from Christ in us, the hope of glory. Um, oh, and I found something really cool when I looked up manifold in the Greek, you know, talking about the manifold grace of God. And I'm not sure if you remember how I shared in a post not too long ago that I received a word of wisdom years ago that where I heard we are Joseph's coat of many colors. And I had elaborated in that post how Joseph is a type or foreshadow of Christ. And I was thrilled when I looked at manifold in the Greek to see that it means many colored, various or diverse or multicolored. And God's grace is on display in the person and work of Jesus Christ through his body his church, and it is displayed through all different types of people with various giftings given by the Holy Spirit. It's a manifold grace. His grace and knowing him is something I imagine will continue to do on into eternity. God is not boring. He is full of unsearchable riches and various aspects that are thrilling to get to know. And our satisfaction really is found in him. You know, we can search everywhere else and nothing satisfies. 
So the message I believe being communicated here by Paul referring to love covering a multitude of sins when we love each other fervently is that if we keep in mind loving each other in the body of Christ just as Christ has loved us, we won't be so tempted to hold grudges against one another, which is the source of murmuring and complaining in the first place. And we know that Christ died for us and pardoned our sins because he loved us. And we can do the same for one another for Christ's sake. It also makes the church look more attractive to outsiders. Truly, when you're abiding in the grace of God, it seems pretty effortless to want to extend that grace to others. You know, you're excited about it. You know you don't deserve it. And you're partaking of it. It gives you joy and a heart of thanksgiving. And you want to share that with other people. And so here it says he wants us to do this so that we'll be blameless and harmless. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Among whom we shine as lights in the world. Harmless in the Greek means unmixed or pure. In other words, not tainted by sinful motives or ambitions. When we get in our flesh, as I like to call it, our motives are not pure or motivated by Christ's love. And we know Christ is not going to harm his own body. But we, you know, we're a different story. We have our two natures and we can be operating according to our flesh. Especially if our pride gets offended by someone, something, somebody's, by something someone says or does. And then we can cause harm in the body of Christ. You know, we can be hurtful. And I thought it was interesting that what the KJV translated to without rebuke in the Greek means to be unblemished or faultless, without spot. And I've talked quite a bit in in past videos about how false teachers are referred to as spots in the Bible. And I'd like to take just a little time to go over other places in the New Testament that the same word is used and in what context so we can see what it means to be considered unblemished or without rebuke. Already from what we've read here today in Philippians, we can see it means holding to the doctrine of Christ and partaking of him ultimately. Because when we're doing that, we are ministers of the grace that we ourselves are receiving, right? Colossians 1 speaks of us being unreprovable or without rebuke when we continue in the faith grounded and settled and not allowing ourselves to be moved away from the hope of the gospel. And remember that 1 John tells us that that is the definition of abiding in Christ. And when we abide in him, we're keeping in mind the gospel, standing on the truth of, of the gospel, which is the definition of walking by the spirit in faith also, by the way. People want to overcomplicate it, but it's so simple. Really, if, if you want to know how to please God and how to walk pleasing in his sight, just abide in Christ. Remember your position in him and rest there. I don't know about you, but I find that to be a tremendous relief over all the re- religious man's religious teachings that are actually antichrist at their core. When you're resting in Christ, that's where the flow of the Spirit is. Where branches attach to the vine. And our source of life is the vine. And when Jesus said that whoever believes on him out of his belly will flow rivers of living water, that's the blessing and supply of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Christ in you. And it's only assessed, accessed, I'm sorry, by faith in his finished work. So just as we read in verse 13, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Again, you you have to abide, and that is believing the gospel. That's that's your faith walk, okay? For God to be able to work in and through you and produce 
good fruit. Okay, so going down to verse 15, or we'll, we, we read 15, but we'll start at the end of that. It says, Among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I've not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and I be offered upon the sacrifice, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. So knowing that the ministry is for the building up of the body of Christ and the equipping of the saints to do the same, if that wasn't happening, then all of Paul's work and suffering for the sake of the ministry would be for nothing. I believe that's what he's saying here. And when he says, if, if he be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith... That offering in the Greek is a pouring out as a drink offering, a, lab, a libation, which means his life was an act of worship to God, being poured out in service and suffering even unto death. But his source of joy, his strength, his vision was God's vision. He saw the big picture, and because of that, he was able to look beyond his suffering to the hope of his calling. And then he said that for the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. That means Paul had been a successful minister of Christ because he had communicated the same hope, the same vision to the church. You know, that's why they were able to rejoice with him and to have joy in the same cause. You know, this entire scripture passage in Philippians reminds me of a concept taught in so many other passages of scripture regarding joy and reward, which a lot of people have this major misconception about reward. What God, we got to know what God is doing, okay? What God is doing is building his church. And as good stewards of his grace, we have the privilege of co-laboring along with him in this process. You know, I used the example before of like letting your little ones bake cookies with you. You're in charge of the process. You are responsible for the outcome, but they get the joy of participating, right? So it is, and it's God who's doing this work through us and our reward, our rejoicing, our crown is tied into this building. And I, I venture to say that many, of, if not most Christians, don't see this. They don't think that way. They don't have God's vision and purpose in mind. Instead, they're more individual-minded and think that if they can just live as good of a Christian life as possible, then they're earning some kind of a reward for themselves. You know, once again, like working to put God in your debt, even though that it's Him that's doing the work, Right? And, but what they do is just kind of haphazard and there's so little joy in that. Seeing the hope of your calling produces joy, so much joy that Paul was willing to persevere through so much opposition and suffering for what he saw. In 1 Thessalonians 2.19, Paul says to the church, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? And I notice many translations flip that around, but it, it makes sense either way. But the other ones say something like, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing in the presence of the Lord at his coming? Is it not you? So when we minister Christ to others, we're building them up on the sure foundation, and that is our reward and our crown of rejoicing. And all we have to do is, as it says here, hold forth the word of life. Let's see, right here in verse 16. Shine the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And since it's God who does the work, we know that comes from abiding in him, which is resting in his finished work. I can't repeat that enough. <laughs> which produces the heart of thanksgiving and a joy that shines forth in our lives to others. 
And as we'll see as we go through Philippians, Paul says also in chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Stand firm in the Lord. And, you know, we aren't competing with each other for rewards here. We're helping each other along. You know, I have you guys seen where someone's running a marathon and one of the runners takes the other one by the arm when they're feeling tired and about to give up and helps them run? They run with them. They might even slow down to to run with them to the finish line. It's just such a beautiful picture. And it reminds me of us in the body of Christ. So... You know, our reward is our shared joy in the gospel, and it's our fellowship in the Lord. That's our reward. I I had had this dream one time. It was very vivid and very memorable, and I was running in a race, but it wasn't competitive at all. And I noticed everyone was going, kind of going around the racetrack in their own unique way. You know, I was on foot. Some were, some people were, we're on foot running or walking, uh, some were on bicycles, some on scooters. And I even saw a guy just sitting down on a skateboard and kind of scooting along. <laughs> it was funny. But, you know, we all had goodwill towards one another, and it was enjoyable. And after I finished making my way around the track, I, I remember I walked over onto the grass on the sidelines, and there was an office desk there, and I knew that it belonged to me. And I reached up and I pulled open a drawer in the desk and it was full. It was full of gold, silver, and precious stones. And in the dream, I was like amazed. I'm like, whoa, where'd this come from? You know? (laughs) And (laughs) when Paul says to run, who is one, one who's running for the prize, he means to keep moving forward, your eyes on Christ. And when we're warned in Revelation not to let anyone steal our crown, The stealing there is like a relinquishing. It's not like they forcefully grab it from you, but like you agree to let them take it. Like they can't take it without your permission. And the truth, the truth is that the devil can't take what you don't give. People can't, people trying to bring you into bondage cannot take your liberty in Christ if you don't give it. Our joy and our crown is the hope of our calling. It's our full assurance of faith in the finished work of Christ and it's rejoicing along with other members of the body of Christ in that same assurance. Isn't that wonderful? I don't know. I just, I I am seriously overwhelmed and so glad that these last few years have been this journey of putting away churchianity and learning Christ and learning the truth from his word and what it really means to be a believer and God's child. And it's so much more fantastic than what most people would have you believe and have you settle for. Um, yeah. And I just, my heart is to share that with you guys so that we can rejoice together. All right. I love you. Have a great evening.